Now while the hatches are going through their painting and weathering process, I also went ahead and took the opportunity to do the same to the periscope inserts. These are the same ones that were showcased before, and the only changes that I made since the last scene was I drilled out the fasteners that are integrally molded in and added small little wire pins. This is so that these units can actually plug into the hatches, as well as just holding them together with glues alone. Now for the painting, you'll notice that the center chunk portion which is actually hinged on the real Tiger one. These units here are painted with the same color as the inside portion of the hatch wells. The inserts themselves on the real Tiger are actually made from Bakelite. Now I've seen them in two colors. They are in black and they are also in a reddish brown. Obviously I went with the reddish brown hue for this model here. The lenses were just simply painted with gloss black which is a typical feature I do on my builds is at this point now where I could go ahead and mount the hatches, or I should say the periscopes, to the hatches. And here the hatch is now completely finished and are ready for installation to the vehicle. Now if you notice I went ahead and installed the periscope inserts at this time here as opposed to what I mentioned previously where I said I was going to mount them towards the tail end of the build. The reason why I changed my mind had to do with the amount of forces required to get the pieces locked into place. If doing this after the model is built and painted, this may put some extra wear and tear on the hinges, which is not something that I particularly want to do. So while the pieces are off the vehicle, I decide to just get them out of the way at this point. Now, the both sides of the hatches are primed, so I'm going to mask up this area over here, which will protect them from any sort of unwanted paint and overspray when it comes time to the actual painting of the model. Now if you notice, the units are of course fully weathered. Now the painting on the parts are the Panzer Grey coloring that is would be on the whole vehicle. If your vehicle is a Dunkel Gelb painted Tiger 1, then the hatch interior sections should be Dunkel Gelb. One common mistake that is made basically on most AFV models on the internet and also in magazines I've seen as well is that a lot of people don't know what color to paint the inside portion of the hatches. A lot of people tend to paint the inside portion of the hatches either flat white, gloss white, or for a German vehicle the cream coloring. This is not correct for the inside portion of the hatches and the reason for this has to do just like with the American tanks you do not want to have the hatches with the brighter color because when the hatches are open this can give away the tanks position if seen from the air. This is why on American vehicles, the hatch's interior coloring is always uh, olive drab coloring, and on the Germans, they followed suit with painting their hatches with the same color as the vehicle that they are mounted on. Now, perhaps you can have the hatches, the interior, a different color than the vehicle if the vehicle was repainted in field. Of course, this was something that was commonly done, and I doubt very much that they would care to repaint the hatches when they would c convert the tank's paint from Panzer Grey to Dunkel Gelb with the camouflage. Now for the weathering, this is just my usual type tactics. The color you see here is actually the dark primer gray that I utilize. The shade of primer gray is very, very close to, to dark panzer gray. In fact, it, you can possibly paint the entire vehicle with this color, and maybe one day I'll go ahead and make a tutorial video on painting a model with this coloring. Anyway, the... The primer gray is the dark panzer gray that you see here, and the weathering is all done with the airbrush and some dry brushing. What was retained was the functional latches, like I mentioned before, and from this point here, the entire hatch is going to be mounted to the vehicle with these three fasteners that I mentioned before. Now for the paints that I used, like I said before, the hatches, as well as this engine hatch here, was painted with the same material, and that is this can of El Cheapo Ace hardware gray spray paint. This is the flat coloring. I never go with gloss for my my tank models. And if anyone is interested, feel free to comment in the video section listed below and possibly I'll go ahead and make a painting tutorial video on utilizing this paint here. Now while I'm doing the hatch installation, I have to make some changes to the countersunks that are found on the mounting fasteners here. The kit does have these sections countersunk. However, if you put on a countersunk fastener, some of the head still sticks above the surface. Now for the real Tiger 1, these pieces were not only super flush with the deck, but arguably they actually descended inward. There's a small little pool where these fasteners would have been located. 
On the model here, I'm going to go ahead and with a countersunk bit on a drill, I widen and deepen the countersunk so that the fastener sits actually below the surface. From this point here, I could then simulate the sunken recess toolless type fastener with the bodywork. And this of course will be added once the hatch is mounted in place. So far I've only done one of these countersunk modifications and once I'm done filming I'm going to go ahead and take care of the other two. With the hatches out of the way the next area to focus on are the Pioneer tools and their tool posts. Now the units that are supplied with the Armor Tech set are actually pretty good. The units that are kit supplied are in this bag that I have over here. Now the components in this bag are comprised of white metal castings from armorpacks.com. This is the same supplier that I used for the bow hatches that I just showcased. Now the the Armor Tech kits do come with these white metal tools and the tools themselves are good. However, the reason why they will not be utilized on this build is not nothing with the tools themselves, it has to do with the actual tool post. The Armor Tech, or I should say the Armor Packs components are just the tools, but they do not have their clamps and other gizmos that are associated with getting them affixed to the vehicle. In their place, I'll be utilizing these sets here from Six Scale Icons. Now, Six Scale Icons is no longer around in its original form as the original owner passed away and sold the business to Field of Armor. Field of Armor I believe may or may not still be offering the following sets in this configuration that we have here. However the six scale icons components were always very highly respected in the 1.6 scale armor modeling community because their quality was always very good. And you can see that from the parts laid out here on the table. All of the parts consist of either white metal castings or pieces of brass photo etch. The photo etch is going to be used for the tool posts and the clamps, while the white metal castings are primarily used for the, the tool heads, and you can see real wooden handles utilized for the remainder of the components. With these parts here, I'm going to be utilizing them as is, and I'm just going to assemble them as per the 6 scale Icons kit and get them mounted to the vehicle. Now, the Armor Packs tools that are kit supplied are not trashed by any which way. In fact, they're going to be just put in my spare parts box and more than likely recycled on another future build that I have in the lineup. The reason why I'm just substituting them for the 6 scale Icons components has to do with simply the simplicity of using the already available tool posts as opposed to having to fabricate new ones for the Armor Pack set. Now on the stock Armor Tech kit, the way you are supposed to strap the tools to the deck are with very simplistic laser cut sheet metal straps that get bolted to the top deck. Again, this will be enough to secure the components in place and they'll do a decent job making them nice, keeping them nice and secure. But the detailing end is again a little bit on the basic side and by swapping them out for these components here will definitely elevate the model. Some of the final details that need to be added to the top deck to finish it off include the tank's bow headlights. Now, in the past, Armor Tech would supply you with these components with the stock kit. On the first generations, they were made from cast metal components. Then they switched to offering you a functional cast bronze set from Steve Winston. And it appears now, on this version of the Tiger 131, that there are no headlight components that are supplied. Now, I might be mistaken with this because Armor, the Armor Tech kit does supply you with some parts from Armor Packs, but from what I've seen in the remaining parts I have left, there are no headlights that are present. Possibly they do, but on this version of the kit that I'm building, they're just not there. In their place, I'm going to be utilizing the set that we have here. These two pieces here are aftermarket components from ArmorPacks.com. Now what's unique about the Armor Packs Bosch light is that they are based and are actually licensed copies from the resin components that were originally sold through Panzerwork.com. The Panzerwork Bosch light was very nicely done. In fact, I've actually used them on one of my static Tiger ones that I did a video series on. In that video, I go over the basic components and I actually made them function. For this model here, I'm going to be doing a similar procedure. The difference of course being the base starter kit for the the headlights. On the Panzerwerk components it consisted of the exact same parts that we have here but the pieces were again made in cast resin. When Armor Packs acquired the 
rights to produce these components himself. He switched the media from resin to the white metal parts that we have here, which is standard for the rest of the armor packs parts, like I mentioned in the last video. What's nice about these parts are that they are totally hollow, which makes them perfect to convert to having them lighted, which is exactly what I'm going to be doing in this video. And you can see how the headlight lens is a very thin hollow casting, which is nicely detailed. It even has the little Bosch logo, which would be stamped onto the headlight lens. Also included are the bases, which the headlights get mounted, and they even have their underside detailing as well. Again, a very nice feature. Now, one difference between the armor pack set and the set from Panzerwerk has to do with the this component that we have here. This is the latch which can, maintains the front portion onto the light and it straps it around. I believe on the Panzerwerk set, it's been a few years now, but I'm not sure if this component was supplied or if it was supplied, it was very, very flimsy with the type of resin casting that this piece is. On the armor pack's part, it is made from white metal. Now, even though it is white metal, it is still on the very thin and frail end, so care must be exhibited by the builder during the construction. Having said that, though, these pieces are very nicely done and will build up excellently and be a perfect match for this vehicle. And here are the headlights now going through their final assembly. Now, like I said before, the tank is going to have functional headlight detailing. Now, to do this, I went ahead and while the pieces were being assembled, I drilled out the center portion and soldered together a LED. And for final assembly, here we have one of the headlights ready for mounting. It has the last of the armor packs components fitted, which of course would include the front shield and the shield retention strap. And here you can see the shield just before it gets mounted to the other unit. Now, the shield, if you notice, I went ahead and not painted or primed the inside portion, and I left it with its in the white metal coloring. The reason for this really has to do with, believe it or not, light redistribution. If you notice before, when I had the LED fitted, I went ahead and masked up the remainder of the headlight so that the inside stays, again, with its white coloring. When the LED lights up, the shiny material of the metal will actually will actually reflect the light coming from the LED, which amplifies it slightly, giving you a little bit more light being exhibited through the slot here. This is actually a common procedure I do on my other builds as well, only with the other builds, and if the pieces are made from resin or any other type of metal, I usually end up spray painting silver aluminum paint on the inside for this exact same application. Because these are already in the white, that's really not necessary and can be mounted just like the way you see it here. Now for the way the component gets mounted on, the if I went, during the construction I went ahead and drilled out two small holes in these two sections here, and so when the the blackout cover gets fitted, it is held in place with the strap via two snip wire, wire brads that do get glued in place. Now the glue is a temporary bond again in case I need to get access to the LED I can simply undo everything and get my access. Unfortunately because of the thinness of the materials I'm not exactly able to make the piece fully function like it is on the excellent Steve Winston sets which are found on the aftermarket scene and are actually supplied with some of the older ArmorTech kits. However, for the application of this model here, the pinned in place units should be perfectly suffice. And from this point, I'm going to go ahead and get these guys done and then get them fitted to the vehicle. Moving on from the headlights, another bit of addition that's going to be added to the vehicle at this point are the hull mounted S mines. Now, the S mines were developed by the Germans from their experiences in Russia, specifically when you have a bunch of pissed off Russians climbing on top of your tank with Molotov cocktails, you need something to thwart them, and that's when these units here were developed. The S mines were mounted along the perimeter of the hull and were found on the early production Tigers. By the time the mid and late production vehicles came out, these units here were already antiquated and were no longer in use because the Tiger had this unit built in as a mortar and it was fastened inside of the turret. Without deviating any further, the units that we have here are from EastCoastArmory.com. Now they come in a set and they come in a set of five. 
the Tiger One only had five of these units spread out on the hull. Now, the reason why you only see three on the table at this point is because the other two which get mounted to the rear section of the vehicle are going to be mounted in another video. However, the detailing is basically the same. However, the difference is how they mount to the hull. On the ones that get mounted to the top deck, there are two straps which actually get welded to the top deck and then the units act as bosses so that the the mortar itself can get fastened via fasteners. On the model here, I went ahead and utilized again the ECA resin set which gives you all of the detailing for the component including the interior clip detailing as well. Now these units here are unloaded. The real unit would actually have a cartridge which would slide into this section over here and would tie into some electrical nodes and the units would be fired electrically from the inside of the tank. Now the electrical nodes and hookups are supplied with the ECA set, however not present in this video as these get mounted at the very tail end of the build and will be discussed further at that point. However, here you can see the units, now they're, they're fully assembled. And from here, they're going to get a shot of primer, and then once painted, they will be then mounted to the top deck. And here's the top deck now with all of its equipment now fitted. I already went over the hatch installation before, but here you can see the installation of all of the tools and the tool posts, the bow headlights, as well as the S mines. Now starting with this chunk of detailing, first it brings us to the tow cable mounts. These were the same ones that were mentioned earlier, and the only change that I made was now you notice I've went ahead and trimmed the threaded rod section off of the top. With the pieces now trimmed, the fastener and the hinge plate can now be removed and open and clear out of the way from the threaded section of the rods. From there, of course, brings us to the S mines. The S mines have been mounted to the deck. Now, they have been mounted to the deck the same way that they are found on the Real Tiger 1. In that, on the Real Tiger 1, on the S mine canisters that are mounted to the top deck, there are two straps that are found on the various locations on the upper hull. These little straps, if anyone wonders what they are when they see like a 116 Tegan or a Henlong, are for this exact purpose. Now this detailing was absent on the kit of course, so I went ahead and fabricated it. It was fabricated out of strips of, of evergreen plastic strip, which gives me the, I believe these were the quarter of an inch wide sections. This gives me the correct width and thickness of the parts, and they were just mounted directly to the bottom portion of the S-Mine canisters, and then blended in with the welds. With these added, this gives the appropriate standoff, the top deck, with these components now added. Now, the only thing needed now to complete the S-Mine is a small little hole drilled into this section over here, and this will be used for the electrical connections, which on the real vehicle would be hooked up to the S mine canister and is what actually would actually fire the unit. However, this detailing is going to be added, but will be added again shortly towards the end of the build. From the S mines now brings us to the headlight. This was again mentioned in more detailing in previous scenes, but the mounting plate was now added. Just like with the S mines, there is a small plate that the headlight secures onto. This was fabricated out of a piece of sheet styrene that was cut and trimmed to shape, then mounted to the top deck and sculpted welds were added again to really seal up and to blend everything in with the rest of the top deck detailing. Moving from the plate now brings us to the conduit detailing. The conduit that we have here is a piece of aluminum floor wire that is nice and thick and is the correct thickness of what the piece would be in real life. The piece was again just bent and secured in place. Now the little strap that we have here is present on the Tiger ones and this unit here was scratch built. The strap itself is pressed out of a piece of brass plate that was trimmed and bent to shape. It's secured to the deck via two miniature brass hex bolts. From there this now brings us to the terminal cap. The conduit terminal cap is present on these Tiger ones, and there were actually two patterns that were used. There was an early pattern and a late pattern. Both patterns are accurate for an, an early production Tiger one like this one here, and the difference has to do with the shape. The early one had this round appearance to it, while the later ones had this diamond-like angled type profile. Now the unit that we have here, as well as on the opposite side, are resin castings from Panzerwerk. The Panzerwerk sets are very nicely detailed and he does offer both configurations. And again, both of them are highly recommended for this 
detailing. Now, currently, Pants of Work, when it comes to selling his components, it's on and off, as he's not doing it full-time anymore, but he does frequently go back into casting some components. I will put a link to his Facebook seller page where he does have his limited catalog posted and there you can contact him see if you could get a hand of these components. Regardless, they are both of which are highly recommended and if you get your hands on them, I strongly, again, can't recommend them enough. Now from the lights takes us back to the hatches. Here you can see the hatches are fully functional. A little dusty, but they are fully functional. They open and close and they're locking mechanisms what was mentioned before. From the bow hatch now brings us to the center portion of the top deck. Here we have the jack block, the air blower, and the Pioneer tools. Now the Pioneer tools and the air blower I already talked over in another scene, but the jack block here is the kit supplied wooden unit. Now from this point here the jack block will be improved slightly by having two metal straps that are found on these two sections here which give the block in, on the real unit more strength. These are going to be added but it will be again added at a later date. As for the clamping mechanism this is all scratch built by myself as modified from the King Tiger jack block detailing set that are found on the ECA product line. The piece is fully functional now currently I do not have a lock pin this section over here so I can hinge the unit open. Remove the jack block, you can see the jack block mounts that are present. These are resin castings that have been blended into the deck via the sculpted weld beads. Once the unit progresses further, the, it will be mounted just in the same manner and a lock pin will be put in place to hold everything at bay. Now there is a small little latch that we have here, but this is for detail purposes only and is non-functional. Now from the jack block now brings us to the upper hull welding. Now weld beads have been added along the entire area of the top deck where it makes contact with the side hull panels which weld beads would be present on the real vehicle. Of course welds are also present on all the tool posts and along the air blower that we have here. Now like I often mention in these Tiger One videos both small and in large scale is that there's another weld bead that most people tend to forget and not know about and that's the lateral weld bead that is found on this section here of the hull. On the Tiger One the top deck was made of two basic symmetrical plates and they were fused together along the center point here and on the back portion there's another little stretch of welds that are found on the area where there's again top deck remaining from the turret ring. This sculpted weld bead was added and, when, and once it is it really helps the look of the Tiger One and is present on all of the Tiger Ones being an initial production early mid late regardless if you have a Tiger One and you're super detailing it with the welds add the center weld bead here you'll thank me. From there it takes us to the tools. Again, these Pioneer tools were mentioned in more detail before, but here you can see them mounted. Again, all of the photo etch tool posts are fully functional and they hold everything in where they need to go. This is true again for the ax, the shovel, and the sledge. Now, the way you see it on this model here, if I zoom out a little bit, this pattern is for a early production Tiger and this is important to point out because during the mid and late production units the tool configuration did change somewhat. As for what the tool location is for those type of vehicles that would be best by looking at a in a Google search where you can find an actual schematic or a blueprint that does have the tools in their other configurations. Now moving along takes us to this little plate here and for the longest time most people have no clue what this plate is for. This plate is found on all the 116 and even smaller scale Tiger ones and I bet most people are clueless to the actual purpose of it. Well this plate here, well of course unless you watch my videos, but if you don't basically what this plate is is for the snorkeling feature of the vehicle. When the vehicle would snorkel the FIFO air induction air intake that's found on the rear engine deck would be unbolted and this plate would be fastened in place. Note the six holes that we have here. With this plate fastened to the engine deck, this partially seals up the engine deck and prevents water from getting into the engine compartment. Once the vehicle is done snorkeling, you would then remove this plate, put the FIFO intake back in place and secure this plate back to this location that we have here. Now as for the mount, this is all scratch built and it's basically made of pieces of plastic or evergreen plastic strip. 
Now, what is currently missing is a metal strap, which will be located in this section over here, and this will be fabricated as the build progresses. Now, from the snorkel plate, now takes us to the main crowbar. That on early Tiger 1s is stored in this location here, and is basically found on most of the other Tiger 1s from this period as well. Of course, the tow cable and stave mounts are added. Again, I went over the modification, I went into these before, and we're just secured to the model via the fasteners, and then sculpted weld beads have been added. At the very last piece is the other S-mine location for the top deck. Now, what's interesting to point out is that the S-mines are not symmetrical on the early production Tiger. There are five total. We have the two on the front, the one here in the midriff, and then there's two more on the rear angled sections, or I should say on the rear corner sections of the vehicle. For some reason, the Germans never decided to put one on the opposite side where the antenna base is kept nearby. If you ever see a Tiger One and you only have five of these S-mines, that's not an inaccuracy and is basically how it is on the real vehicle. Now, a quick addition to the crowbar is that, like I said before, the crowbar is the aftermarket component and that supplied me with the latch that I have here in the center. However, it was not fully complete. Two of the detailings that need to have been added is the little end clip that we have here, which is fabricated out of a bit of bent brass stock that was then secured to the deck with the fasteners that are mentioned before. And also the one we have here in the back, which is the rear receptacle for the pointed section. This was fabricated out of a piece of steel plate that was pressed and bent into shape, secured to the deck via fasteners, and then blended over with the welds. Finally, the last Pioneer tool that was added was the clipper that is found in this section over here. Again, this does differ from the initial to the early production units, but the early production tanks feature it in this spot, as, and it's a basic rule of thumb. Now, this, the tool itself is from Armor Packs, like I may have mentioned before, and is the one that's supplied with the Tiger model from Armor Tech. Now, the rear section here is supplied and was simply mounted as is. However, what is absent is the center mounting portion. On the Tiger One, this was held in place via a wing nut and a plate, and there is a fastener that is secured to the deck. On the model here, I went ahead and fabricated the little mounting strap out of a piece of metal, sheet steel specifically, and the tool simply lifts off. For the center fastener, this is actually just one of my brass fasteners that is bolted to the top deck, so it's nice and secure, kept in place, and once the unit gets fitted, the only thing that's left remaining is a small little detail wing nut, which will be added, of course, at, towards the end of the build. Once everything is added, however, it will keep the unit firmly in place and will prevent it from walking itself loose during the model's operation. With the top deck details now out of the way, it's now time to make the final push on completing up the interior. And this does include making some slight modifications to some of the functional systems. Now, because I went ahead and mounted the ArmorTech main control box vertically, and in this location here, the hull, this did require some extra add-ons. Now, with the way the set is designed, we have these quick connect jacks that simply get plugged into, into this section here, and then these go and mount to the various amount of equipment and functions that are found on the model. Now, normally, if this was mounted horizontally in the hull, this wouldn't be anything to concern about. But because I went ahead and heavily deviated from the stock configuration with the addition of the engine compartment, some tweaks have to be made to this unit. And we can see them here in this scene. You'll notice that the quick connect jacks have been changed in which before they were mounted straight up and down, and now they have to be mounted laterally. The reason for this has to do with the top deck's turret ring design. The turret ring on this version of the Armored Tech kit does descend deeper into the lower hull compared to the ones found on the earlier units. With this new turret turner ring, if I would have left these jacks sticking vertically, they would have all made contact with the turret ball bearing, which is definitely less than ideal. So instead of trying to redesign anything, all I went ahead and did was took strips of quarter inch wide brass 
sections and solder them directly to the various quick connect jacks that they would be plugged into. By doing this, I could then change the location, or I should say the orientation of how the plugs now connect. Rather than pointing up and down, they're now pointing to the side, which leads for a much lower profile for the equipment in this section over here and will definitely avoid any problems. And here's the top deck now fitted to the model. Now from what we can recall, the top deck is not held in place with any sort of external fasteners. It is purely held in place via the magnet system that I showcased in an earlier video. The piece just drops directly in place and you're basically good to go. With the top deck on, you can see why the clearance for these electrical systems here had to have been changed compared to the stock configuration. However, now that they have been changed with their direction, you can see now the amount of clearance that I have for these components here, and it is more than enough to do the job at hand. Now, before I can test the TART rotation system, I need to first turn on the model. And that is done with, of course, turning the radio on first. Now that the radio is on, we're going to turn on the tank. Now, you heard that high-pitched beep. That is the Benedetti sound system powering on. The sound system is patched into the RC Electronics and is all hooked up. However, it's not fully calibrated yet, which I'll go over in a few moments. However, now that the tank is on, I can rotate the turret, or what eventually would be the turret. Now, as you can see from this new turret rotation system, that the unit has zero lateral or up and down play whatsoever. The reason for this lack of any lateral motion has to do with the way the ball bearing system is designed. It is actually very precise and outputs all power that comes from the turret rotation motor to rotating the gear. Now it is it is because of this why the amount of of care needs to be exhibited by the builder on the fasteners that hold the turret rotation motor in place. This is why I went with the mods that I mentioned earlier in the video. Also, it's good to see why I added the oil to the ball bearing, specifically once everything was still new, to, in order just to break it in. The turret can rotate 360 degrees without any sort of hiccups and is equally as powerful in both directions. Now, like I said before, this is great that the Viper system was pre-calibrated or I just I got lucky with this radio choice and no other configuration was needed. Definitely a win. Now, like I said before, the tank's sound system is fully functional, albeit not fully calibrated. For the calibration, more than likely, I'm going to be outsourcing that to my buddy out in the UK, who does phenomenal work with his own sound systems, and he has done a build of mine in the past, and the sound system was one of the best units I've seen calibrated. So, definitely going to rely on him to do that while I focus on the remainder of the build itself. However, the sound system can still be triggered by the radio, by the center knob that we have here. Now that would be the throttle driving at full speed. However, the, as you can see, I'm not exactly driving the tank. But I do have the ability to turn on and off the sound system, which is more than enough needed for me to test to see if the speakers are good and if the other systems are functional, which so far everything's a green light. Well, this was a pretty big step and now out of the way, I can focus on adding the last of the FIFO system components hooking up the headlights to the lighting circuit, and then finally cracking into the tank's turret and turret detailing. The model's basically at the three-quarter way mark, and from this point on, it's basically going to be a downhill build, which is definitely something I look forward to see, as this is one build I definitely want to see get finished. And with that, that wraps up this project update video for this 1.6 scale ArmorTech radio-controlled early production German Tiger 1. 
If you're already not a subscriber, subscribe to this channel, which is the best way to keep in the loop for new posted content, whether it being project update videos like this one here, or model showcase videos when they get posted. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have photographs of this particular build that have been posted since project start, along with the other ongoing 1.6 scale builds, as well as the smaller builds that frequently get posted on the channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detailed components. Thanks for watching.